In the wake of the Derek Chauvin verdict and the number of shooting deaths against unarmed black people in cars, we've talked a lot about the fear we as black people have when we're driving. But it's not just driving. Moving throughout the day and doing the simple everyday tasks and errands that a white person takes for granted often comes along with microaggressions and racist actions when you have a skin color like mine. Take, for example, shopping. From being followed by security to being questioned by cashiers and eyed suspiciously by fellow customers, we've pretty much seen it all. But then came Bonquisha, Facebook post that went viral before it was taken down. So here's what happened. A woman named Trinity Bethune went to buy a car at a Honda dealership in North Carolina. When they posted the photo of her with her newly purchased car last week, they called her Banquisha, which, if you've been paying attention the last 10 seconds, is not her name. While the dealership did not explain why the mistake happened, they did apologize and fired the employee who posted the comment. Honda of North, Car North Carolina, North America, excuse me, says they condemn the discriminatory remarks and they are investigating the incident. Joining me now is journalist Mara Schiavon Campo. She's the host of the podcast Run Tell This. And Mara, I'm kind of obsessed with stories like this one because I think it gives a, gives us space to talk about the ways black people have to deal with indignities, basically no matter what we're doing, like in every situation. So in this instance, this is a car dealership. So how can this car dealership essentially right the wrong here? What do they do to rectify this situation? Well, you know, they say that they've fired this employee and that this was an isolated incident. And if that's the case, if they did, in fact, fire the person who was solely responsible, um, then I think that's a great start. But one of the most important things, I think, when we're having this conversation is what you just mentioned, is how we have to respond to these indignities. Because what's important in this story here is to look at how Trinity responded to that insult. Let's be clear. Calling a, a Black woman whose name you don't know, Von Kusha, is absolutely an attempt to demean and diminish and insult her. And you see her response to that in the Facebook post was composed, it was dignified, and that is what really deserves to be highlighted here, is that even when something is upsetting, you can't behave like you're upset. Even when something is maddening, you can't get too mad. And it shows you that in the face of these indignities, we are still required to be composed, whether it's security following us around, whether it's somebody accusing us of stealing something that we've already paid for, because otherwise you go instantly from being the victim to being the aggressor. Oh, that is so true. I remember um, it wasn't the last U.S. Open. It was like a few U.S. Opens ago when Serena Williams had that moment with the umpire. And the moment she said, you owe me an apology, I was like, it's a wrap. This whole situation is going to go downhill because a black woman asserting that she deserves an apology from a white man that just never goes over well. And do you think that we, we should talk about that more? We should talk about the fact that women of color often have to stay calm in situations where it is really difficult to stay calm, where they are actually being harmed and wronged. And yet we're not even allowed to get mad. Yeah, a hundred percent. You know, and I and I think every black woman probably has a story like this. You know, I remember my child being petted on the head like she was an animal by a stranger on the street who was just fluffing her hair and the deep breaths and the prayers to Jesus I had to take to not <laughs> lose my composure because I didn't want the police called on me. I didn't want to be the aggressor, even though a stranger was petting my child like a dog. You know, there's this angry black woman stereotype that we are always fighting against. But guess what? Sometimes we got a lot to be mad about, but we are not even allowed the space to express that human emotion because instantly it turns into something much worse for us. And that's part of the emotional and spiritual burden of being a Black woman. We're not even given the space of having natural human emotional reactions to things that are often upsetting. It is so true. That's why I work out so hard, honestly, because right. I, I just want to yell a lot. But I actually I, I, I don't find that in this body yelling um, affects the change that I would like to see in the world. So I, I have to run and, and do a lot of uh, exercise. <laughs> um, yeah. So so one of the other things that I've been thinking a lot about in lockdown is the fact that, you know, I'm, I'm kind of 
Lockdown's kind of my jam. I'm, I, I don't know if you noticed, but like I'm quite productive in lockdown. And the reason why I'm so productive is because I do not have to deal with microaggressions. I do not have to deal with catcalling. I do not have to deal with even some aggressive behaviors by people out in the world when I'm just commuting to the office. Um, what can we do to utilize our time in lockdown so that we can prepare ourselves to go back out in the world? Because that's actually what I'm the least looking forward to is dealing with the person in the hallway that tells me to smile in the office. You know, it's funny because a lot of people have used this time to try to spiritually recharge in the absence of the daily assault. And the you know, microaggression is the perfect word for it. It's death by a thousand cuts. They are teeny tiny things that in isolation really wouldn't mean anything to anybody. But when you're facing multitudes of them day after day, and you are constantly having to respond the appropriate way, go home and just swallow it, try to run it off, try to sweat it out. It is mentally, emotionally, and spiritually exhausting. And I have often wondered, how much more would I accomplish in life if I didn't have to devote so much emotional energy to fighting these kinds of things? What, what could I do with that space if it were free? And I think a lot of people right now are able to answer that question. And so they're doing it by affirming themselves, affirming their beauty. There is nothing that I have found more affirming than seeing Black women like you, where you're natural okay. on television. I'm seeing it all the time now. Ten years ago, we never saw that. And just being able to see right. our beauty reflected and to focus on those things. Now is the time to do that because we have to armor up because we do have to go back to that world. It's so, so true that I in, in lockdown, you sort of have that extra space. And I was like, what could I do with that space? I could get a whole other job. Apparently, I could have a whole other job. I had the energy for a whole second job <laughs> because I don't have to deal with that other stuff. Um, <laughs> or just just to keep it 100 percent real so you know, they, or we could live longer oh, go ahead. because these are the things that are killing us these are the things that are leading to hypertension and heart disease and diabetes the, the mm -hmm. things that black women and black men over index on health wise so many of them are stress driven so these things are literally shortening our lives and killing us that's how bad it is that is such an important point because my mom, she has this line where she always says, don't, th don't let them kill you, Zerlina. And I, I think that she means just like the world, the, the cruelty of the world, the racism of the world, the sexism, misogyny, like I have to somehow survive it. Um, and unfortunately, you are right. Black women have higher incidence of stroke, hypertension, high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease. Do you think that we, we make enough of a connection between these indignities, like the black woman in Victoria's Secret in New Jersey? You know, I feel like experiencing that is going to make your blood pressure a little bit higher. Yeah, and even in that case, I mean, that's another example. Look at the way that the woman who was reporting, the black woman reporting, dealt with this. She is being chased around a store by a woman who is clearly emotionally unbalanced and she laughed but we all know that that wasn't funny and she didn't find it funny she's probably tremendously disturbed and upset by that she probably went home that night and was terribly upset by that but in the moment she had to laugh it off and there is a cost to that there's a cost to always pushing everything down but i think the counterbalance is black joy you know there's a saying that joy is an act of resistance and I feel that's no more true than in the mm -hmm. black community. It is in our comedy. It is in our music. It is in our food. It is our commitment and our love to our family. I personally have been leaning so heavily into those things because I have come to realize that joy is not optional. It is a necessity, especially in this America. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So do you, do you think we as black people really need to get proof of these kinds of microaggressions to prove that they really happen. I feel like, you know, in, in a similar way to police interactions with black people, uh, you know, the evidence is in the videos that we see circulating around social media. But black people know these things have happened all throughout history. Now we just have that evidence. Do you think it's good to have the evidence? Do you think it's helpful to have the evidence? Does it make it seem like it's happening more or mislead people to think that it's happening more frequently when this has always been the case. 
You know, I like to say that I think the cell phone is one of the most important tools for advancing civil rights this country has ever seen, because it's not that these things are happening more often, it's that we are finally able to document them. And for so long, people in the Black community certainly knew that these things were taking place. But when you would try to explain it to others, they would shrug it off. They would try to reason it away. Well, how do you know it was because you were Black? Well, maybe you're being a little paranoid. Um, there wasn't the validation. And the validation comes from the proof and the evidence. So when it comes to something that's criminal, it actually can help getting justice on a criminal level because you have evidence. When it comes to being exculpatory, if you've been accused of something that you didn't do and there's dash cam video or if there's police body cam video, then it can be very useful in that way. And when it comes to things like we're seeing with the shoppers, the, the, the woman of Victoria's Secret, um, it just validates our experience. And sometimes that can lead to a measure of justice, which is comforting. You know, Amy Cooper, the Central Park Karen, um, did face charges for that. And, you know, a couple decades ago, that encounter might have led with Christian Cooper hanging from a tree. I'm not being hyperbolic. This is our history in this country. Right. You know, as Charles Bull likes to say, I scream, you die. White tears are very dangerous to black people. Now we have some protection.